Now the subject I've announced is applying Old Testament prophecies to the church and nation today. And yesterday I had a very interesting experience which introduces this subject. I spent the morning in the magnificent auditorium of the Trade Union Congress Centre in London, listening to speeches about closing the gap between rich and poor, both within this nation and between the nations, between the first and third world. And all the way through the speeches, the Old Testament prophets were being freely quoted. The first speaker was the Minister of State from the Department of Trade and Industry, and he quoted, if I remember, Jeremiah and Micah. Gordon Brown quoted Isaiah. Later speakers concentrated on Amos. And here I was in the TUC Center listening to Old Testament prophets being quoted. And all the speakers assumed that you can take what God said to Israel and take it as it stands and apply it to nations today without any modification or adjustment. And I thought, well, that introduces my subject for tomorrow night. So, let's begin with basics. We believe in a living God. What do we mean by that? We mean a God who is active in this world, who is doing things and saying things in space and time where we live. Now, when um, one philosopher, Nietzsche, the philosopher behind Hitler said, God is dead. Did you hear about that, God is dead movement? Well, what he meant was not that he had ceased to exist, but that he'd moved to another world and therefore was no longer doing anything or saying anything in our world. My daughter is dead, but I know she's very much alive and fully conscious, but she's no longer able to do anything here or say anything to us. That's exactly what Nietzsche meant when he said God is dead. And somebody put up in a German university a notice, God is dead, signed Nietzsche. And some student wag wrote underneath, Nietzsche is dead, signed God. <laughs> Which I thought was a pretty good rejoinder. But we believe in the living God. And the Bible is the record of his deeds and his words in space and time in our world. Now, how does he speak? What he does is, of course, in nature and with nations. He operates on his creation and he operates on the nations of people he has made. But how does he speak? Sometimes he speaks quite directly but only occasionally. I mean by that that my voice box is moving the air in my throat and that is causing vibrations in the air which are reaching your ears and which you hear. Occasionally God speaks like that and vibrates the air audibly so that his voice can be heard with physical ears. He did that when uh, Jesus was baptized this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And people said, it's thundering. Well, the air was vibrating and they could hear it. But that's not his usual method of speaking in our world. His usual method is to speak indirectly through people and to use their voice rather than his own. I can understand why. That gives people the freedom not to listen, the freedom to refuse what he's saying. It treats people with respect. If he always spoke, indeed if he spoke to this meeting tonight through a thundering voice in the atmosphere, he would all be on the floor quickly. But he treats us with respect and speaks through other people so that we can refuse to accept what is said and dismiss it. We are free to do that. So we have what are called prophets of God, whose mouths God uses to speak to us. They are simply God's spokesmen, 
and they are simply passing on his words and therefore they can use the first person singular as if they were God. I am, I will. The prophets don't say, he says this. I read in the newspaper this week, Confucius, he say too much. <laughs> and that's third person singular, he say. But the prophets use the first person. When God gives a message, they give it exactly as God gave it to them, as if it's God speaking. I will do this for you. I will do that. Now, they received the message in two ways. My definition of a prophet is first, someone who listens to God. Because you can't speak for God until you've listened. Until you've received the message, you can't pass it on. So a prophet is, first of all, someone who's learned to listen to God and receive a message from God. And they received it in two ways, verbal and visual. Sometimes it came in the form of actual words, which did not come into the ear, but came into their mind, as clearly as if they'd heard someone speak it. Or they heard it visually or received it visually. They saw a picture, a vision. And they saw in that vision what God wanted to communicate. They communicated it on to people in many different ways, at least four. There was, of course, the simple way of simply speaking it. God says, I will. But there are many other ways. They acted it. Isaiah streaked through Jerusalem naked. And his message was, God is going to strip this city of everything. He was acting the word of God. Uh, Ezekiel buried his underwear by the river of Babylon. Who else? I can think of all sorts of things. Let me think of another. Jeremiah wore a yoke over his shoulders. A yoke of burden and said, you are going to be yoked to an enemy. Then they lived the message uniquely in their married life. Jeremiah never married. He was told not to because his family was under a curse, which meant he would die, not of old age, but in middle age. And God told him, I don't want you to marry. I want you to remain single. And then Hosea was told to marry a prostitute. And he did and had three children, one of which was his and loved by the mother, the next was his, but not loved by the mother. And the third wasn't his at all. And then she went back to her old trade on the streets. And he was broken hearted, left with three children. And then God said, go and find her again and buy her from the pimp who's running her. And bring her back and put her in the bedroom. And after a time, love her again. Hosea said, why do I have to do all that? Because that's how I feel about Israel, says the Lord. Now you can tell them you felt it, you've experienced it. And then Ezekiel, your wife's going to die. And you mustn't mourn for her, you mustn't cry. Because I'm not crying over Israel. And Ezekiel had to live out the word of God. A fourth way that they passed it on was writing it down. A man called Barak wrote down all Jeremiah's prophecies and they were passed on in writing. So they received the word from God verbally and visually, but they passed it on in many different ways. Now they had the word of God, so they had the knowledge of God's word, but they needed something more. They needed the spirit of God primarily to give them the courage to say it because they would be risking their lives to pass it on. They needed amazing courage. They were not popular preachers. Their message was usually very unpopular, not what the people wanted to hear. So they required courage and therefore they required the Spirit of God as well as the Word of God to do their job. Interestingly, in the New Testament, the most frequent gift of the Spirit or Yes, gift of the Spirit was not tongues, but a Greek word, parasia, 
which means boldness. And they were filled with the Spirit and spoke the word with boldness, says Acts 4. Now that's what the prophets had. And nearly every prophet mentions the Spirit of the Lord coming upon him. This gave them the courage to be a true prophet. Because accompanying the true prophets were many, many false prophets pretending to give the word of the Lord but not really giving it. They hadn't heard. They were not used to listening to God and so they couldn't give. They copied messages from other prophets. And one of the distinctive features of a false prophet was that they gave comfort to people. The true prophet challenged people. The false prophet gave comfort because that's what the people wanted. They said, peace, peace, when there was no peace. That's how you can tell false from true prophets often. False prophets give the people what they want God to say. True prophets give the people what God is saying. And that's as true today as it was then. Now what we don't always realize is that the prophets were geared into history. They were crisis men. They came always at a particular time, in a particular place, for a particular reason. They weren't just general preachers or teachers. They were crisis people. And they came at certain crises in the history of Israel. And that's important to note. That in itself should warn us against taking their prophecies out of that crisis, out of that situation, and applying them generally to church and nation today. Unless the situation today is the same as the situation they were in, we have no right to transfer their message. So they were geared into the history of Israel, and the history of Israel was his story, God's story. And in particular, the prophets appeared at times when the nation was on the move, on a journey. And in particular, they were there when the rise of Israel and they were there at the fall of Israel, particularly. They were there when Israel was coming up as a nation and they were there when Israel was going down as a nation. And they accompanied their journeys. The rise of Israel took a thousand years and there were prophets all the way through beginning with the journey from Ur to Canaan, from where Abraham was born to the promised land. What you may never have noticed is that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are called prophets. God says, don't touch my prophets. And he referred to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Joseph was not called a prophet. I want you to notice that. He did have dreams and he heard from God, but he was not a prophet. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were prophets. They talked with God. They listened to God. They had a message from God, and they passed it on. And they are called prophets. The second journey into the promised land was from Egypt to Canaan again, after the uh, slavery in Egypt. And once again, it was accompanied by the greatest prophet of all, Moses. They needed prophets to tell them to get out from where they were and to go to where God wanted them to be. That was why there were prophets at that stage in their history. So Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were prophets when they had to come from Ur to Canaan and Moses was the prophet to get them from Egypt to Canaan again. What you probably don't know is that in the Old Testament the books from Joshua to Kings Joshua 1, 2, Samuel 1, 2, Kings, are all called the books of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. They're not in our Bible. They're usually regarded as history, but no. They are called the former prophets by the Hebrews because they include all kinds of people who brought God's word to them while they were on the rise and establishing as a nation. Four scrolls of the Hebrew Bible are called the former prophets and they include those books right up to Kings. 
Now the fall of Israel took half as long as the rise. The rise took a thousand years, the fall took 500 years. It only took them half the length of time to lose everything they'd got. And as they did so, that's when what we understand as prophets came into their own. Warning the people, go on like this and you're going to lose everything. And that's why they're known as doom and gloom prophets. They were bad news. They were warning of the loss of all that gained under King David. So the fall of Israel was the exit from the promised land and the exile in Babylon. And you have a host of prophets who accompanied that crisis. Just as you had prophets for the um, what I've called the exodus and the entry into the land, so you had a whole bunch of prophets for the exit from the land and exile in a foreign country over again. Those are the ones we tend to think of when we think of prophets. They are called the latter prophets in the Hebrew Bible, former prophets for the rise of Israel, the latter prophets for the fall, but we just call them the prophets, of whom there are 12 big ones and 12 little ones. Not little men, but little books. And unfortunately, they're not arranged in our Bible in chronological order. They're arranged by order of size. The big prophets, the big books come first and the little ones second. Just as in Paul's epistles, they're not writ, uh, published in the order in which he wrote them, but the biggest first, Romans, and the smallest, Philemon, second. It's a funny arrangement, isn't it? Quite illogical, but there it is. So we have three big prophets, major prophets we call them, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and twelve little ones or minor prophets. Notice that in the Hebrew Bible, Daniel is not a prophet. That's where he is in our Bibles, he shouldn't be. Daniel, like Joseph, was a dreamer, but not a prophet. And the Jews don't count him as a prophet any more than Joseph. I just throw that out. But Daniel, in your Bible, comes between the three big prophets and the twelve little ones, which makes you think he must be a prophet, but he isn't. Well, now, that's the historical situation. I want you to see that the latter prophets, according to the Hebrews, and what we call the prophets, divide up between three groups. Those who warned before the exile, those who told the word of God during the exile, and those who reconstructed Israel after the exile. So we have pre-exilic, mid-exilic, and post-exilic prophets. And they were all speaking to that situation in Israel, which may or may not apply if God told me that Brit the British people were all going to be taken away into exile, and I believed it, then I could begin to apply some of these prophets very directly. But what we tend to do is take their words out of the context, out of that crisis, and apply them generally. The Germans have a, a very good phrase. They talk about the Sitz im Leben which means the situation in life in which God said what he did. And the trouble is we tend to treat the Bible as a box full of texts that we can quote to prove something, and we take those texts right out of their life situation. Everything God said, he said in a particular sitzim leben, a particular situation. And when we study the word of God, we must always go to that life situation. And then we'll understand. <coughs> Take as an example a text from, uh, well, I won't tell you where it's from. This is the text. I have met only one man in a thousand I could respect, but not one woman. Now, that's the word of God. It's in the word of God. I'm quoting a text. Have you ever heard a preacher preach on that? He wouldn't dare today, would he? <laughs> you will only understand that statement if you put it back in the situation in life in which it was said. It was said by Solomon 
who had 700 wives and therefore 700 mothers-in-law and seven and 300 mistresses on top of that and a man who has all that will have no respect for women at all and that text becomes the truth once you put it into its life situation now therefore when we study the prophets we must always go back to the crisis or the life situation in which they said something lest we take it and apply it to a totally different situation. I think I've made that point. So let us now move on to the rather complex chart that I've given you and analyze the prophet's message and see what they said. And though they treated different situations, most of the prophets who preached around the exile, that crisis, have a very similar basic message. On the one hand, they were speaking to the Jewish nation, the people of God. On the other hand, most of them spoke to other Gentile nations as well. But their message to Gentile nations was quite different from their message to God's chosen people. Let's start with God's chosen people. The prophets were very conscious of history because they believed that time mattered to God. I don't know how many preachers I've heard say that God is outside time and that heaven will be outside time and when we die we shall move outside time. The Bible never says that. That's Greek thinking about God. Time is real to God. I'm not going to say time, God is in time. I will say time is in God. Just to bring this right home to you, one thing God himself, almighty, omnipotent God, cannot do is change the past once it's happened. He can change the future as we can, but he cannot change the past and neither can you. God has that limitation of time on him. I thank God he can't change the past because he can't undo the crucifixion or the resurrection. Can't change it. It's done. It's fixed. That just tells you that time is real to God. And God never promises to change the past, but he does promise to change the future. That's good news. So time is real to God, and it was very real to the prophets. And so the three dimensions of time come out in their message the past, the present, and the future. They are often in scripture called seers because they can see into the past and the present and the future. They had what we call hindsight into the past, insight into the present, and foresight into the future. And their messages were tied up with those three dimensions of time. The only complication then was that when they looked into the future, they could see two things and not just one. They could see the bad news and the good news. The bad news of what would happen in the immediate future and the good news of what would happen in the ultimate future further on. So that's the framework of their thinking. It's a framework of time. And I've given... Uh, four titles to the four things they saw. When they looked into the past, they were recollecting what God had already done for his people and said to them. So when they looked back, it was a message of recollection. When they had insight into the present, they could see all that was going terribly wrong in the people of God. And I've given the label recrimination to that. And they had to rebuke and confront people with what they were doing. Not a popular thing to do. When they looked into the future, in the immediate future, they saw retribution. They saw punishment. They saw chastisement. They saw God dealing severely with what was wrong in his people. But always beyond that, they saw restoration. Even the darkest clouds had a silver lining. There was always 
beyond the doom and gloom of what would immediately happen, some good things beyond. Jeremiah is so noted for what he saw in the immediate future, all the doom and gloom, that he's become a byword in English. A Jeremiah is a gloomy prediction about the future. And people even say, you're a Jeremiah. But actually, Jeremiah also saw the distant future and said, I've given you a hope and a future. He was not all doom and gloom. So that's the outline of the, uh, the framework, if you like, of the prophecies to Israel by these pre-exilic, mid-exilic and post-exilic prophets, all of whom were inspired by the crisis of losing the promised land that they'd taken a thousand years to get. Let's spell out the message in a little more detail. Time and again, the prophets appealed back to the very special redemption of Israel from Egypt. The Exodus is their primary appeal to the past. God brought you out of slavery, gave you your own land, in which none of the diseases of Egypt followed you. You were healthy, you were happy. You had your own security, you had everything you wanted. God gave that to you. You should be grateful but you're not. And they used to appeal back not just to the redemption from Egypt, but to the special relationship that God established at Sinai when he married them. That's a picture that goes all the way through the prophets, that Israel is God's wife, that God is her husband, that he married her at Sinai when he said, I will. And they responded, we will. When they made vows to each other, and you'll find that someone like Hosea sees that whole Sinai event as a wedding between God and his people when they became covenant lovers. And so this appeal is always back to the redemption from Egypt, back to Sinai, back to the special relationship and also they constantly reminded the people of what happened in 40 years wandering in the wilderness when things began to go wrong so quickly, when they longed for the diet of Egypt instead of manna. Do you know what manna means? It means, what is it? <laughs> and when they picked up the manna off the desert floor, they said, manna, what is it? And they had what is it for breakfast and what is it for lunch and what is it for tea and what is it for supper. And the kids said, not what is it again. <laughs> and they longed for the leeks and the garlic and the spicy food they'd had as even as slaves in Egypt. Things went terrible. Even when God gave them the Ten Commandments, the people down below were worshipping a golden heart, calf and having an orgy. And the prophets would remind them of what God did for them in the Exodus and at Sinai. And then, and look what you did as soon as God related to you and got you out of there. And you're still doing it. You can see they're appealing to the main three feasts of the Jewish calendar. The Passover recollects their Exodus from Egypt. Pentecost is on the date of the covenant of Sinai when God gave the law and 3,000 people died. Centuries later on that exact day, God would give the spirit and 3,000 would get saved. But when the law was giving, the law kills and the spirit gives life and the law killed 3,000. And they were appealing to the Feast of Tabernacles, which commemorates the wanderings in the wilderness. So can you see that in their looking back they were appealing to what God had done and how they responded and reminding them of the three feasts of their calendar year. And their message was twofold as they looked back. Divine faithfulness and human faithlessness. God kept his promises. His people didn't. That's the message from the past that all these prophets have. 
when they come to the present, they had insight in, into what was going on. And we can summarize it in three words, idolatry, immorality, and injustice. Those three follow up one another as the night, the day. If you worship a false god, it won't be long before you are behaving badly. Not just yourself, but in relation to others. And so you can sum it all up there. It was a failure to love God and a failure to love their neighbor. Those are the two things. When they looked into the future... They warned that the God who worked through nature and nations would punish them. In nature, they said you can expect drought, failure of crops, locust swarm, <coughs> earthquakes. That's how God will punish you through nature, because he's the living God in control of nature. But through nations, you will be attacked, you will be invaded, You'll be occupied and you'll be deported. The God who controls nature and nations will use both to discipline you and to punish what you're doing. Amos, for example, talks about earthquakes. Joel talks about locust swarms. I've only once been in a locust swarm and I was frightened stiff. <laughs> the sun went out at midday for an hour. And a cloud of locusts were flying at 12 miles an hour. And the sun was blotted out for one hour. And every green thing was gone in a second. You could hear them all munching. And the poor Africans, were, it was in Kano in northern Nigeria, and the poor Africans were beating them off their precious crops. With their Trees were not only stripped of leaves, but of the bark. They were left like white skeletons in less than a minute but just hundreds of these chewing things they're only about four inches long it's a frightening thing but it was one of the ways that God used to punish his children that was the immediate retribution in the near future but always beyond that the prophets looked to the distant future and there they saw restoration they saw Israel ruling the nations. They saw Israel back in her own land. They saw Israel with the Lord again, as well as with their land again. They saw this very clearly, and they always included this distant hope for the future. Now, we've got later tonight to talk about what do we do with those promises to Israel? Because the majority of churches in this country say they don't apply to Israel anymore. They've been pinched by the church and applied to the church. We'll come back to that. Well, now that's their message to the Jewish nation. When they talked to other nations, and they did a lot, there are whole chunks of Isaiah, of Jeremiah, of Ezekiel. Some of the minor prophets are exclusively preaching to other nations like Jonah and Obadiah and Nahum. They're not preaching to Israel, they're preaching to other nations. Now, what was their message to them? Totally different from their message to Israel. Because they were speaking to nations who'd not been redeemed from Egypt, who'd not got a covenant relationship with God. So how did they apply these four recollection, recrimination, retribution and restoration to other nations? Well, first of all, they didn't say God brought you out of Egypt. They said God put a conscience in you. And you can see the creation around you. And from creation you should know there's a God. And from your conscience you should know that he's concerned with right and wrong. Exactly the same appeal of Paul in Romans 1. That people who've never heard the gospel, never heard the Ten Commandments, never read the Bible have no excuse for being atheists because they've got a conscience inside and they've got creation outside. That's the appeal to other nations. You should know instinctively what is right and wrong. God has written the law in your hearts. And that's true. What are they condemned for? Idolatry, 
immorality? No. Other nations are condemned for inhumanity and injustice, for cruelty to their fellow men. They should have known better. You see, it's quite a different message. Their failure to respect human beings is basically the sin with which other nations are condemned. As uh, Amos begins, for three sins and for four I'll deal with Egypt. For three sins and four I'll deal with Assyria. And so on it goes on. Gradually homing in on the people of God. But when you study what God condemns other nations for, it is the failure to treat human beings with respect. That's an interesting comment, isn't it? When it comes to retribution, he promises that God will punish them, not for their ignorance of the commandments or the gospel, but for the things they knew were wrong, which they did. That's the answer to those who constantly say, well, what about those who've never heard the gospel? God can't condemn them. Oh, yes, he can. Because they've heard his law through their conscience. If a man said to me, I have always, always obeyed my conscience and always done what I knew to be right, then I would tell him, you're going to heaven. But I've yet to meet a man who could say that. Gentiles are not condemned for not knowing the truth of the Bible but for not listening to their conscience and drawing the right conclusion from the creation that God has made. The, the vengeance on the Gentiles will be matched by the vindication of Jewish people. For since these nations are the nations around Israel, not only does God condemn them for being cruel and barbaric to their fellow human beings, but particularly, he judges them for their attitude to his people. What they did to Israel, they have done to the God of Israel. Just as Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done this to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it for me. What people do to Jews, they are doing to the Jewish God. And what people do to Christians, they are doing to the same God, who is also the God of the Christians. That's a very important point. People say, well, I haven't done anything against God, but you have done things against God's people. And that's the same thing. You've touched the apple of his eye. And that, by the way, is not a Cox's orange pippin in your hand. It's the iris of your eye, the most tender, sensitive part of your body, protected by your eyelid. Look into a mirror and you'll see the apple of the eye, the iris. It looks like an apple on end. And what God is saying is, my people are the most sensitive part of me. Touch them, you touch me at a very sensitive point. And these nations had touched Israel. And many of them had touched Israel with awful cruelty. They'd taken their babies and dashed their brains out against the rocks. And God will punish. Yes, God willed that Babylon should take the children of Israel into exile but he did not will the cruelties of the Babylonians and Habakkuk 2 lists those cruelties and says God will punish you for that he gave you permission to take them away but he did not give you permission to be so cruel about it if I may bring that right up to date I produced a two hour tape on Mel Gibson's film there are copies available for you you need them quickly before you see it. But you see, I don't believe that what Pilate did to Jesus was God's will. God had willed that Jesus would be crucified, but the scourging which forms the major part of that film was Pilate's idea to try and placate the Jews and get Jesus off. God never ordered an animal to be tortured before it was sacrificed. Did he? But unfortunately when God says something must happen. Man always adds barbaric cruelty to it. Just as the Edomites added to the exile. By taking advantage of it to uh, be cruel to the Jewish people. 
They were condemned by God for that. God did not will the extra inhumanity and cruelty to his people. He willed that they should be taken out of their country, but not treated with barbarity. I throw that out to get you thinking. Now, what is the restoration promised in the distant future to Gentiles? And the answer is there are many prophecies in these prophets that Gentiles would be incorporated into God's chosen people. Hosea particularly predicted that. The immediate future for Gentiles who were cruel to Israel was bad news. But the ultimate was that from those very nations, God would draw in even more than the Jews to be part of his chosen people. So it's basically the same framework of the message, but a different application. I think I have time just to move on a wee bit. And then we'll have a break. And I'm sure you're ready for it, aren't you? No? All right. Well, you know, unbelievers can watch the television for hours so we can spend a bit of time with God, can't we? Right. Well, let, let me move on. There is an awful lot of indiscriminate application of Old Testament texts today. Without thinking... Most of those speakers I heard in the TUC yesterday were using texts from the prophets as political mottos, as slogans, and none of them referred to the context, the life situation in which they were first given. And I'm afraid we Christians do this ever since two bishops did a very naughty thing with our Bibles. One of them was French, and he decided to divide the Bible into chapters. God never wanted that. God gave us his word in books, not in chapters. And then an Irish bishop thought he could improve on that and give us verses and numbered every sentence. God never wanted that. The result is that we no longer search the scriptures, we just look them up made it far too easy and the worst feature of it is that we then quote a text out of context and think we've proved something let me prove that to you how many of you could quote John 3.16 to me let me see put your hand up if you could I'm not going to ask you but if you could put your hand up right now how many can, can could tell me what John 3.15 says or John 3.17 do you see what I mean? Two or three hands go up. We take that text right out of its context. And it was not the gospel that Jesus or the apostles preached, but we've made it the gospel we preach. We've ripped it out and applied it when we shouldn't. It was part of a private theological discussion. It was never preached that by the apostles or Jesus himself. But we say it's the gospel in the nutshell. Now then, let me give you examples of texts that are ripped out of context and quoted, and we can look them up, chapter and verse, but they're taken out of the life situation in which they were spoken. I give you one example of a text we apply to Israel, another that we apply to Britain, and another that we apply to the church without even thinking what we're doing. Psalm 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I think I hear that every week in life from somebody. Now, what do we mean by it? What did it originally mean? We don't bother to ask. We don't ask what was the situation in Jerusalem in which David said that and exhorted us to follow it. You see, peace to us is a negative thing. It's absence of conflict. And many people are praying for peace between Palestinian and Israeli. Peace between Arab and Jew. Peace between Islam and Judaism. There can never be that peace. But you see, we apply it to the political situation today and we make it a political prayer. But in its life situation, Jerusalem was entirely Jewish. Jewish. 
David had made sure of that. He'd invaded it, taken it, made it his capital. It was the city to which the 12 tribes went up regularly for worship. And his concern was for harmony, for shalom, doesn't mean absence of war. It means presence of harmony. And he realized that the biggest need of Jerusalem was harmony among God's people. And that a divided people of God in the capital where God had placed his name would be an offense. So are people who are praying for Jerusalem today praying for harmony in the Jewish people? It's desperately needed, hawks and doves. They lurch from a government of hawks to a lurch to a government of doves. And it's causing chaos. Do you know there are a hundred political parties in Israel today of whom 16 managed to get seats in a Knesset government of a hundred seats? And none of them has the majority. So they all have to work out coalitions which are always weak. They can break up at any time, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for harmony among the Jews. And what about the Christians in Jerusalem? Dear me, Church of the Nativity, five denominations occupy the Church of the Nativity. Coptics, Orthodox, Ethiopian, the lot. And they are in such disharmony that they have an Arab Muslim doorkeeper to open and shut it because none of them will let any of the others have the key. You're laughing, but it's tragic. And every denomination wants its church in Jerusalem and it's full of divided Christians. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. What do we really mean by it? We use it as a motto for our prayer meetings, as a kind of slogan but we're giving it a political rather than a spiritual meaning. Take another example. Let's take Britain now. If my people, who are called by my name, will repent of their wicked ways, I will heal their land. Their land, of course, means Britain and America. It started really because we had a wonderful musical came over the Atlantic called Come Together. And those who wrote that were determined to write another. It's not always God's will to follow up. (laughs) And they wrote If My People, which made 2 Chronicles 7.14 a slogan for Christians everywhere. And they assumed that if we repent, Britain will be healed. That's not the promise at all. That promise was made to God's chosen people and the land was the promised land that he gave them. It was their land because he'd given them it. Now when the Jews were dispersed around the world before Christ, they were dispersed, the diaspora, they were in every other land, they never applied that text to the land in which they lived as strangers because that was not their land. So though they lived in Italy and Greece, they didn't claim that promise for Italy and Greece because they knew it didn't apply. It applied only to the land that God had given them. But we take it and we take this phrase, their land, to mean wherever we live, that's our land and that's what God will heal. It does not mean that. It doesn't even mean your back garden, even though you may own it. Did you know the Queen owns your back garden? In theory, the Queen owns everything in this country, even my suit. And she has a right to take it from me. The Queen simply has to come to your house and say, Oh, I like your car. You have to give it to her. A friend of mine refused and upset her greatly. But in theory, we don't belong any here. And you know, this New Testament says, You are strangers, aliens, sojourners. This land is not your land. That's your land. That's your home. But we've taken that promise out of its life situation and claimed it to heal Britain. I'm sorry, but 
I don't believe we can do that. Take another text. Apply to the church now. If you will bring all the tithes into the storehouse, prove me now herewith, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing as you cannot contain it. I've heard so many sermons based on Malachi 3 to make Christians tithe. Of course, it's a quick way to sort your church finance out. If you're going to tithe out of every member, you're going to do well. Do you realize it's putting people back under the law of Moses? Christians are not under the law of tithing. It's a tax that the old people of God had. We're not under the Sabbath law either. That belongs to Moses' law. And we're free from that law. We're under the law of Christ. We're under the law of cheerful giving. That God doesn't want your money unless you want to give it. Totally different covenant. But how often a text like that is used to boost church funds. I've heard it many times. But they never quote the verse before it, which says, God has put us under a curse because we didn't tithe. That's what he said to Israel. I've only heard one preacher, and you have as well, uh, preach the curse to a Christian congregation and say, if you don't give a tenth of your income, your great-grandchildren will be cursed. Because the curse is to the third and fourth generation. I thought that was wicked preaching. But at least it was honest. He was preaching the curse on tithing as well as the blessing. We are not under that. But how easily that verse has been taken out of the prophets and transferred to the church without thinking. You see, many of the prophets of Pilar, you are breaking the Mosaic law. And frankly, I'm breaking the Mosaic law as I stand here. This is a... No, it's not a Marks and Spencer's this time. It's uh, somebody else. But it's a mixture. And the Mosaic law says I must not wear cloth made of a mixture. Because God is pure. That was right for them. It's not right for me now. Because I'm under a different covenant. And the old covenant is now obsolete. Now this failure to understand that these texts, many of them, were preached to a people under the Mosaic law and who were breaking it and whom God was going to curse because they did and bless if they obeyed it. We can't do that. Well now why do we take so many Old Testament texts and apply them to church or nation today? The answer is threefold. First, that in naivety we are mishandling scripture. We don't seem even to have noticed that scripture has come to us in an Old and New Testament. We treat it as if it's all one book. It's actually 66. The word Bible comes from Biblia, which is plural and means books, library. And we need to remember that. But we do at least have a two-part Bible, Old and New Testament. And that means we can't just pick up something from the Old Testament and apply it to the New Testament people. There has been a big change in God's dealings with us. And it can be just sheer naivety that treats this book as a box full of texts, proof texts, that we are free to quote a verse anyhow. And many preachers do that and have you chasing through the Bible, looking up texts from all over the Bible without telling you this one's from the Old Testament. But, oh, it's in the Word of God, so you can just quote it. No. Naivety is one reason. The second reason is called replacement theology. And this is widespread in the church in this country. The idea that the church has replaced Israel as the chosen people. Therefore, we can take what was said to Israel and apply it to the church. Well, I hope there aren't many here tonight who believe that. God has not switched from one chosen people to another. He has actually grafted us into the old one. 
But the relationship between Israel and the church is a very tricky question. And our answer to it will color our use of the Bible. But replacement theology has meant that we take texts from the Old Testament and assume they apply to us. Thirdly, Christendom has done it. I was speaking about this freely last Saturday, so I mustn't uh, say too much tonight. But from Constantine onwards, church and state became mixed up again. In the Old Testament, there is no difference between church and state. Israel is a theocracy. There are criminal laws mixed up with moral and religious laws in the law of Moses because it was all one. Israel, like Islam, Judaism, like Islam, is a theocratic system in which there's no division between church and state. They belong together. Whereas in the New Testament, Jesus made it quite clear that he was separating them. He said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. These are two separate issues. Similarly, you will see it in Mel Gibson's film. He rebuked Peter for using a sword to slice off a Roman soldier's ear and later explained to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world or else my servants would fight. The use of force in religion is acceptable in a church-state theocracy, but not in a separation of church and state. And when, under Constantine, the Roman Empire became officially Christian and church and state became one, incidentally, that really boosted infant baptism because you were born into church and state at the same time. But it meant the beginning of the use of force, both to defend Christianity and to extend it the use of military force as well as political force that led to the Crusades. What we Protestants don't always remember is that the Protestant reformers in the 16th century kept that church-state relationship and forced Protestantism on people by act of parliament. And England went through a crazy period when she had a Protestant monarch, then a Catholic monarch, then a Protestant monarch, then a Catholic, and everybody had to change because politically there was an established religion. And we are living to see the collapse of Christendom. I thank God for that. We're going to have to adjust from being a Christian nation into being a church and a pagan nation because the link between church and state has almost disappeared now and will probably totally disappear in your lifetime and mine. Well now, Israel was a theocracy in which laws applied to religion as well as crime. And so is Islam. But Christianity is not. Now because we think in terms of Christendom and even Protestants, why did Northern Europe become Protestants, Southern Europe not? Well, because the political leaders in Northern Europe imposed Protestantism. The pastors of Lutheran churches in Germany are still paid out of taxes. They are established. They're part of the state. Now, all that is changing. Now, let me say one positive thing, and then we'll have a little break. Let me say something encouraging. (laughs) I've been fairly critical and negative up till now. Let me say something very positive. Everything that the prophets of the Old Testament said about God, you can say today. Everything they said about God still applies because God has not changed. What they say about God's dealings with his people has changed. But what they say about God himself has not. The God of the prophets of Israel is our God too. The God of Israel is the Father of Jesus, one and the same. And therefore, everything they say about God, we can be confident to say today to anybody because he's the God of all nations as well as one. There was a heresy early on in the church by a man called Marcion. 
You've probably never heard of him, but it's known as the Marcionite heresy. And he was the first Christian to say the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New. Have you ever heard people say that? goes back to Marcion. And so he would not preach the Old Testament. He said, I preach the God of the New. The God of the Old Testament is hard. My God is gentle. The God of the Old Testament punished people. My God pardons people. The God of the Old Testament was a God of righteousness. Mine is a God of love. And he drew this very sharp contrast. The God of the Old Testament ordered people to be killed. The God of the New Testament says, no, don't do that. And it's a heresy. And unfortunately, it's rampant today. And there are many people today who dismiss the God of the Old Testament and say, I want to follow the God of Jesus. Much nicer God. Liberals did this. We call them liberals because they sat loose to the authority of Scripture. And they picked, they, were, they did a pick and mix on Scripture. It's interesting that those who dismiss the God of the Old Testament as altogether different from the God Jesus came to show us have to cut out bits of the New Testament as well, especially the book of Revelation which seems so like the Old Testament God that they don't like it. And unfortunately, even the most popular Christian author today, whose books are selling by tens of thousands all over the world, I was asked to write a commendation of his latest book in the English edition. I read it. I said I couldn't possibly. In that book, he said, Jesus came to show us the mother love of God as distinct from the father love of God in the Old Testament. Listen, Jesus' Bible was the Old Testament. Jesus' God was the God of Israel. There is no difference whatever between the New and the Old Testament picture of God. He is gracious in both. He is loving in both. He is righteous in both. He is judge in both. And if you try and drive a wedge between them, you are into downright heresy. Why do we have the Old Testament in our Bible? Why not just the New? Because you will learn about Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, but if you want to know God, you better read the Old, as Jesus did. He's the God of all nations and the God of one nation. Now, that's the first half of my talk. And we've laid a foundation now for saying how then do we apply Old Testament prophecies to today. And I've given you that one very positive word. You can preach the God of the Old Testament prophets without any fear, without that you'll misunderstand or misapply. Now can I, before we break up, just mention two other books I brought? Well, one anyway. 1,400 pages for under £10. Boy, what value. (laughs) Worth the paper alone. It's good paper and good print. But it's my book covering the whole Bible. And especially the prophets. If you want to know how Christians should handle the prophets, get the book. All right. It's on the bookstall for you. And again, I'm not trying to sell it. I haven't had a penny out of this yet. (laughs) <laughs> I'm hoping to I'm hoping to someday but never mind some of you will have seen the eight volumes it came out in and the eight volumes cost 65 pounds not surprisingly they didn't sell all that well but now it's selling at six or seven hundred a month and if you want to get back into your Bible and particularly if you want to follow up tonight by studying the prophets I heartily recommend this go and have a break get your cold drink